some want the crown But they won't bear their cross It takes everything To serve the Lord Some want bright mansions But they won't pay the cost And it takes everything To serve the Lord It takes your hands and your head And your heart, yes it takes your own your time and your means and your prayers less you fall it takes everything serve the Lord some wear his name while they still live in shame but it takes everything to serve the Lord They want to be seen, but they don't want to live clean. But it takes everything to serve the Lord. It takes your hands and your head and your heart. Yes, it takes your all. It takes full surrender to serve the Lord. Everything, everything, child, to serve the Salvador is known throughout Brazil for having a vibrant, unique culture. 
It boasts the fourth largest population of Brazil, with almost 3 million people. The Adventist Church has experienced significant growth here, with churches scattered throughout Salvador. Despite the strong Adventist presence, there are still unentered areas of the city. Global Mission is working to identify areas with no Adventist presence and establish new congregations there. Josenildo's neighborhood is one of these unentered areas. He was known as a drunk nuisance whose bad habits disrupted his family life and the whole community. Arivaldo, an Adventist, lived nearby and ran into Josenildo often on his way to work. Arivaldo knew he was looking for work, so he offered him a construction job, building churches. It didn't take long for the two of them to become friends. Arivaldo treated him with respect, which made Josenildo wonder why he was always so kind. Over time, Arivaldo asked if he was interested in Bible studies, and the two began reading the Bible together. Before I met Jesus, I didn't have happiness. When I came to know Jesus, my life was transformed. And today, for God's glory, I am happy. My family also was transformed. Josenildo was baptized and changed for the better. Even his neighbors took notice of his transformation. When the usual loud music from his home stopped one day, everyone wondered if he was okay. When they checked on him, they saw that Josenildo was a changed man. He spoke kindly to them and treated them respectfully. And they wanted to know what inspired these changes in his life. Josenildo used this opportunity to minister to his neighbors. Every Friday night, they gather in his living room to talk about their week. They bring their concerns, requests, and praises here. Josenildo points them to the Bible, showing them a creator who cares deeply about them. There's even something for the children, as Josenildo's daughter leads an activity in the hallway. This group has grown close, and as a result, 10 people have already been baptized this past year, and more are studying for baptism. Small groups like this one are the core of church planting in Salvador. Small groups develop into congregations, and these congregations divide into more small groups that spread throughout the city. Nearly five years ago, the church leadership in Salvador State had an ambitious goal of building 1,000 churches in five years. They reached their goal, and the final church is being built where a new congregation will worship soon. The goal of building 1,000 churches across the state isn't just for the purpose of having new buildings. The church buildings represent ever-growing congregations of believers who, like Josenildo, have been changed by Jesus. Jesus is good. Jesus transforms. Just as He transformed my life, He can transform anyone's life. No matter the struggle someone may face, Jesus has the power to transform their life, and more lives are impacted as churches are planted throughout the world. Thank you for helping us change lives by supporting church planting through Global Mission. With Bibles in hand, this church planting duo began exploring their new community, introducing themselves to neighbors and hoping to connect with them. They knew sharing the Adventist message in a city like Lima could be challenging. With a population of almost 10 million people, Peru's capital is one of South America's largest and busiest cities. As in many other urban areas, people are often busy and interest in religion is fading. There was no Seventh-day Adventist congregation in this part of the city until a local Adventist family took the initiative to start one. First, they began meeting for worship in their home and invited their neighbors to join them. Then they invited theology students from the Adventist University in Lima to come preach in the streets. This event stirred up a lot of interest in the community. As the family spoke more and more with their neighbors, they realized there were many needs. 
they recruited other Adventists in Lima and arranged a health expo for the community. People appreciated the compassion and genuine care they encountered. Soon after the first health expo, Dina and Katarine were called to serve full-time through the 1000 Missionary Movement, an initiative started and supported by several of the Adventist Church's world divisions. When Dina and Katarine first knocked on Abigail's door, they asked if they could pray with her. Abigail gladly accepted their invitation, and the girls returned each day for prayer. After a few doorway prayers, Abigail invited them inside, where Dina and Katarine offered her Bible studies. With each visit, the girls noticed how Abigail struggled to maintain her home. She was having a difficult pregnancy at the time and had another child to care for. She often didn't feel well enough to keep up with household chores. Dina and Katarine eagerly began to help. They assisted Abigail by cleaning, cooking, and taking her child to school. Adventist church members in Lima also gathered food to give to the family. Their acts of kindness showed Abigail the love of Jesus. It's been several months, and Abigail still looks forward to the weekly Bible studies. She's just one of 40 community members whom Dina and Katarine visit regularly. Through Christ's method, Dina and Katarine have helped plant a new church in this neighborhood where about 30 people worship each Sabbath. Please pray for church planters like Dina and Katarine, who are on the front lines of mission. Pray for strength and compassion as they continue to reach others for Christ. Thank you for supporting Adventist Mission. Spirit, Holy One, 
Elder Pedro McKnight. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Today is Saturday, September 11th, 2021. We'd like to welcome you all to the South Park Seventh-day Adventist Church Sabbath School. I hope that you had a good week. I hope that you're blessed today and that you're in good spirits. And I'd like to invite you as we continue to study this quarter's lesson describes rest in Christ title of our lesson this morning is called longing for more we should always want more of jesus amen so let's open up with a word of prayer let's bow our heads dear god our heavenly father creator of heaven and earth we ask you dear god to please come into our hearts here this morning tabernacle with us reveal yourself to us and allow us to have a fuller understanding of what you require of us and the love that you have established and set in place for us. Help us to be your witnesses. Help us to invite others into your hallowed, shallow, enormous rest so that we can have rest ourselves and invite our families and friends to rest also. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This morning we're going to start off our lesson. And this is the 20th anniversary of September 11th. And um, as we begin this, I'm going to deviate a little bit from our lesson this morning to talk about the Art Museum of New York. But I'm going to talk about another museum that is now established back home in New York, which is at Ground Zero. It is the Freedom Tower. The Freedom Tower is the tallest, largest skyscraper or building in the Western Hemisphere. And I think that, I think the tower height is 1,776 feet. That is symbolic for the date of the birth of our country. And I believe that tower is symbolic because not only on this anniversary, but on what our lesson is here today. And I'm honored this morning. Please forgive me before I get started. I have Sister Mosley. I'm so focused in jumping in our lesson. That's called excitement. You're ready to go. <laughs> I'm ready to go. Sorry about that. Thank you for joining us here this morning. I apologize. But there's a museum in New York that was established and com um, commemorated shortly after 9-11. They erected it's on Fulton Street, I believe, if my memory serves correctly. I know someone's going to correct me right now if you Google it. There used to be two towers, twin towers. And you had the North Tower and the South Tower. I'm going to mention this in our Divine Worship Hour, but there's the North Tower and the South Tower. Between both of them, there used to be a Marriott Hotel. I was at that hotel many times for conferences in New York City. And right now, they built a Freedom Tower, and the Freedom Tower is made out of octagon, eight triangles, eight triangles that are in an octagonic shape. The bottom of the Freedom Tower now is three foot to six foot walls of concrete, reinforced. Now, we know that anything can be destroyed if man puts their mind to it, but it's built to last as long as God permits. I'll put it that way. And it's built as an example of man's enduring resilience. Despite all the tragedy, despite all the heartaches, despite everything that has taken place, it's built to commemorate what has taken place, the tragedies. You know, I was in New York City in 1993, 
at an engineering conference at the Punta Hotel. And that was the first attack where they tried to attack the World Trade Center. That was unsuccessful. But nine, eight years later, they came back and did what they really wanted to do. And I'm, I'm remembering now, that Tuesday morning, my phone was ringing because I was in New York City that weekend. I just got back from New York. Um, and I remember my phone was ringing and people were calling me and saying, hey man, are you in the city? I just was tired, I just got back in. And it's interesting that the Bible uses examples, man uses examples, and this whole lesson this week is about the example God is leaving as a legacy to us as his children of how to persevere, endure, and how to learn from our mistakes. And I've made many mistakes in my life that I thank God as Christians we have a Redeemer and a Savior who can restore us and bring us full. And this week, as and on this Sabbath, as we reflect on the lives that were lost, freedom, we're only free by the blood that was shed. Amen. And I think people don't understand that freedom, there's a price for freedom. And freedom costs. Our soul salvation was cost by the blood of Jesus Christ. As a nation, our freedom has been paid by the blood of those who have died in our service. So as we go into this week's lesson, let's look at these examples that Paul's talking about, the examples that are being identified so that we can learn from these, ex these examples and hopefully not commit the same mistakes again and go forward. Absolutely. And Sabbath School members, whether you're watching us virtually or you're present today, Elder McKnight and myself, we've tried to develop a model which I've seen consistently week after week. We will ask you if you have a Bible study guide to pull it out. It's also on sdanet.org. You can find them there. And we're also going to ask you to pull out your printed or digital copies of the Bible. And we're going to have some practical applications. So there's a three-tier model of we'll do the Bible, the spirit of prophecy, applications that you'll be seeing us do in just a moment. Correct, correct. So let's get into our questions, our questions for this week. What was the purpose of the Old Testament types and shadows and rituals? There are many rituals that took place in the Old Testament. This whole quarter, we're learning about how to rest in Christ. And many of the rituals reflected sanctuary worship and sanctuary services. Even what we do here at South Park, and I'm pretty sure around Birmingham, whether you're at Hillsview, Ephesus, First Church, um, East Birmingham Mission, Lighthouse, there are certain routines, there are certain rituals, there are certain things that we do that are a reflection upon what is going on in heaven and maybe what was done 5,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. So let's get into that. So you asked the question, what was the purpose, purpose of the types and shadows and rituals? And so, members, if you will look at, uh, what is this, 1 Corinthians, that's our memory text and it's given to us in the English Standard Version. So what's the purpose of all of these rituals and shadows? And, to, um, and it reads as follows. Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. So the key word that I'm going to walk away with, the purpose is, is an example for us, me, you, the, uh, the generations that have come before us, those that will come after us. And so you are an engineer by trade. Uh, so we, we, you, you all deal with blueprints. I could not understand a blueprint. You would have to talk to me in a level, layman's terms, about what's in your blueprint. I'm a teacher by profession, so this is my area. Why do I need an example? Because sometimes concepts are so difficult to understand. And Jesus was the master teacher. I mean, all he, and, and he could just take a concept and make it plain. And what did he use? He used objects. He used types. He used symbols. But I would like for the Sabbath School members, if you don't mind, turn to Hebrews 8.5. This one, this one text just blew me away. Elder McKnight. Okay. Uh, Hebrews 8.5 is where I am now. If you'll be so kind as to join me, Hebrews 8.5. And so what's the purpose of all these types, shadows, and rituals? It says as follows. Who serve until the example and shadow of heaven. 
thing. So God did what? He took earthly things to point us to heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for see, saith thou, make all things according to the pattern shown to thee in the mount. So as Moses was getting ready to, ex uh, to, to build the earthly sanctuary or tabernacle, he had to have a blueprint. And what was that blueprint all about? It was from the heavenly because the earthly one was not built yet. So Moses had that vision in the mount with God, and he was given an So these are examples are from us. I like this phrase, keep it simple. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. So and so God gives us examples. He just keeps it simple. And all of these rituals and models and types are for us to understand what's transpiring in heaven. That's think, the purpose. I think that's a great ex, uh, explanation and a great description. A little bit of tongue in cheek. Two, three years ago, Brother Pride is here. I don't see the pastor here yet. Brother Pride and I were at a meeting with one of our architects. Brother Pryor may remember this. We were in Bessemer. We are in an in a, in a architectural office and a construction office in Bessemer. And while we were there, they were describing the new church. And we had a whole bunch of schematics, right? Big, big boardroom table. We were going through these schematic diagrams. And Brother Pryor looked at me afterwards all over. He said, now, you're going to have to tell the pastor because you're going to have to describe all this. When we came in the pastor study and described it to him, the pastor looked at me and said, you know what? I get it. But the saints may not receive this. Why would they? We're going to keep it simple. You just said it. That's where the animation came from. The video that we showed, we're not going to show it now, but that's where the animation came from. If you were here at South Park, of the new South Park Church, because the pastor convinced me, he said, listen, you're going to have to create a visual image of what the new church will look like. And I'm looking at him, I said, what are you saying? He said, I want you to bring this to life. I want you to create an animation of what the church will look like. He said, he said people are not going to get these schematic drawings. So, so Elder McKnight, I want to say, yes. there are visual learners in this room today. Right. If all I, of us. If I see a picture, you know, you can stand there and talk to me all day long. Right. But if you can not only talk to me, but let me look at something while you're talking to me, I'm with you. I want you 100%. So God is that same exactly. what type of learners all of us are. Some are people are auditory, some visual, some got to do the kinesthetics. But he is so, he's the master teacher, and all the teachers who have come forth are just trying craft their trade, and when you get a teacher who can take a complex subject and make it simple, you got a good teacher. A excellent teacher, because what happens is you learn by seeing. Mm -hmm. That's like trying to teach someone how to do the brush stroke. When I learned how to swim, this, this, the instructor said, McKnight, get in the pool, and I want you to move like this, and move like, and all of a sudden I'm looking, and I said, he said, I want you to do it in the water, but then I want you to stand outside and watch what I do. Yes. We learn by examples, like if you try to teach someone how to shoot a jump shot, you put him in the court, you put the ball in his hand, you show him how to hold the ball. Yes. Christ did this as an example, as a living testament yes. with Jesus Christ coming, but as a living testament so that there would be no doubt as to what should be done and how it should be done. And so let me give you a freebie. So teachers, when we're doing our graduate studies or under, undergraduate studies, they teach us a model. It's called, called the Graduate Release of Responsibility Model. P. David Pearson came up with it with some other scholars. And the model says that what you do is when you're instructing, there is a I do phase. And so Jesus came to earth. Yes. He was a great teacher. I do. He, I do. Right. So he pulled these disciples. They were rugged men. Some learned, many unlearned. And then he went to the next part of the model that they, we do. So he taught them. Right. do he went and said go ye therefore and teach all nations so, so that's a great teacher the I you're modeling the we we're working together and then you turn them loose to do the commit the great commission amen amen let's go forward so how is the entire history of Israel an example of, of our Christian walk with God I'll say that again how is our how is the entire history of Israel an example of our Christian walk with God 
What spiritual lessons can be learned from their examples? <laughs> so can I just say, can we keep it real? Are we modern day Israel? Some people would say yes. And so what we see of the historical Israel's is should be applicable to us to make us wiser. Is, is that, could that be true? Yes. All right. So you need a Bible text, don't you? Yes, we do. All right. So uh, Sabbath school members, if you will turn to 1 Corinthians 10. And so we're asking, answering the question, how is the entire history of Israel right. an example for us today? 1 Corinthians 10. And we're going to begin with verse 1. 1 Corinthians 10, starting at verse 1. How is the historical Israel applicable to us today? And I'm reading as follows. And I just happen to have a King James Version, but whatever version you have is fine. It says, moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant. So the historical Israel is to help us to be wise modern-day Israel, So, because he doesn't want us to be ignorant. How that our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. So Elder McKnight, I'm going to pause on one. What does it mean to be under a cloud and all past? What, what are we talking about here? Well, God was like leading them in the day by a pillar of cloud. So his physical presence was always there. And now? And now his physical presence is there through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's look at verse 2. And we're all baptized unto Moses in the clouds and in the sea. So is this a literal baptism of Moses? They crossed through on dry land by Moses stepping into the water. So they, they so Moses was the leader yes. of the historical Israel. Israel. Correct. Who is our leader today? Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's Amen. look at verse 3. And did all eat the same spiritual meat? So what spiritual meat were they eating? They ate manna back in the old back in the day. Because they didn't have a, they had millions of people, I guess, who left out of Egypt. But the Lord physically said a few lessons ago that they picked up manna on Friday for Sabbath, and they picked up enough during the week. So what is our spiritual meat today? <laughs> what are you holding? The Bible. All right. Okay. The Bible. It's, we should, I hope, everybody <laughs> pick it up every morning. <laughs> every day. Every day. Amen. 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 Okay, verse 4, and I'll move it along. And all did drink the same spiritual drink, and they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So how did Christ represent himself? What, where, how did they know Christ was with them as they did that historical journey? He led them by the pillar of fire at night. He led them by the cloud during the day. He provided their physical needs so they could receive their spiritual instructions. Yes. And when you hurting physically, there's a disconnect in the yes. mind. You yes. may not be able to recognize who God is. If you, have, if you see a hungry man on the street, you may not be. I remember, um, I can't go into that story. We don't have enough time. But we need to be able to satisfy the physical body so the spiritual God's body can be fed. Okay, verse 5. But yes. with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. So everybody, that, that generation who left Egypt were overthrown in the wilderness. But how many of that group actually went into the Canaan land? Was it, was it two or was it one? Was it Joshua and Caleb that actually were able to, to go into the cause of unbelief? and plus some of the next generation of those who came out. The entire generation <laughs> who did not believe yes. fell in the wilderness. Mm. Now the Bible does not actually give us a specific number, but the Bible said that all of you who are 40 years old and upward, who, who possess unbelief, that's what he said, mm -hmm. will not enter the promised land. He let them die in the wilderness. Application today. We must have faith. We mm -hmm. must believe. Our faith may not be perfect, but our faith needs to be concentrated in the promise of God and the fact that this is the hardest part about what I'm about to say. We need to have that perse persevering faith because God does not answer our prayers all the time instantaneously. He's too wise. He, that's true because we probably would take credit. <laughs> <laughs> we, would take, we would take credit. Okay, and then let's say verse 6 of 1 Corinthians 10. It says, now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted neither be ye idolaters as some of them as it is written the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day 
23 and 20,000. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of the serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyed. Now all these things happen unto them for example, and they are written for our admonition unto whom the ends of the world are come. So all of this, this biblical account is not just for you, it's for me, it's for everyone, it's for so ever will believe. Correct. That's deep. That's deep. Now the biggest thing here is that we learn is that they were in the wilderness. They saw the ten plagues. They saw the blood on the doorpost. They saw the death angel come. They saw their exodus out of Egypt. They saw God leading them by a pillar of clouds during the day and far at night. They went into the Red Sea. They crossed the Red Sea. They saw the wall of fire protect them as they went on to the dry land, mm -hmm. onto the other side, and yet they were lost. Now that's scary because you and I can see miracles in our own life. We can see God's hand of blessing in our own life, and we still can be lost if we are not mixed with faith and action to profit us. Let's go to our next question because our time is running out. Okay. We're going to go now to Hebrews. Yes. Hebrews chapter 4, everybody, New Testament. Our question is, how can abiding in Jesus gives us true understanding of the biblical concept of rest? True. Our text, yeah, our text of scripture will be Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. Would you like to read that for us, Sister Moses? Yes, I will. So you're saying the question again is, how can abiding in Jesus Christ give us true understanding of the biblical concept of rest? Okay, so Hebrews 4, if you're there, Hebrews 4, and I'll begin at verse 2. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So how can abiding in Jesus give us rest so there seems to be a problem here in verse 2 that it didn't profit them because it was not mixed with faith they heard it but they didn't believe it they didn't believe it okay in verse 3 for we which have believed do enter into rest as he said as I have sworn in, uh, sworn in my wrath if they shall enter into my rest although the works were finished from the foundation of the world going down to verse 6. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must in, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. So we have unrest. We don't have rest because of our unbelief. It, it, could that be said? That's true. Okay, so that verse 6 says that we don't have rest, we're denied because of unbelief. If I go down to verses 10, it says, for he that is entered into his rest, he also cease from his own works as God did from his. You're not trying to work your way to heaven on your own merits. You're relying on the blood of Christ and faith in him. All of our righteousness is nothing we can do to earn salvation. Correct. We're, we have faith in Jesus, Jesus alone. Correct. Verse 11. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Now, what is talking about unbelief? That was the historical Israel's unbelief, all that have come before us who didn't believe. So if we really want rest, we've got to have faith in what God is able to do, and we have to surrender. I like the word surrender all because it's all because of Jesus that we can have the rest. And you know what? Sometimes you think about rest. You know, you ever see after they win a, a basketball game or a big good football game, they say, well, what are you going to do now? I'm going to Disney World. But well, what's going to happen at Disney World? <laughs> They're going for what? They're going to get some rest. Get some rest. But right. have you ever been somewhere and your mind is still turning right. and you don't have that rest you need? So the rest we need is peace and acceptance with God. That's the true rest. Amen. My, our, our time is running out here quickly, but my version of the Bible, I have an Andrew Study Bible. I have one minute left. <laughs> it says, unbelief here is described as disobedience. Mm, okay. So if you don't believe, you have unbelief. The Bible also describes it in certain translations as disobedience. 
And this is important because faith is an action word. Even though when you say, I have faith, you can be standing still. The mind, the body is in action and belief in Christ. And that is hard, especially when you're waiting on promises to be delivered from God. Because when you don't see it being delivered and you're waiting, that it becomes insurmountable. The weight wears on you. And you're waiting and you're believing. But God here is a restorer of the breach, like we discussed last week in our lesson. And this is very important. Our last verse that we have to go through in our time is running out. Sister Winfrey has already given me the, the hook. Let's read through it very quickly. Hebrews chapter 3. And One what, what's over. our question? Hebrews our question 3? is, mm -hmm. what does the phrase harden not your heart mean? Harden not your heart. So you want he Verse 12. Verse 12. Hebrews 3, 12. Take heed, brethren, let of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Verse 14 of Hebrews 3. But exhort one another daily why it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold fast, hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast until the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation. So don't harden, so don't, you hear the truth, but you don't act on the truth. Exactly. That's hardening your heart. That's hardening your heart. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're so resisting. Our, you're resisting. Our time is running, winding up very quickly here. I'm going to invite you to go back and look at these promises. Look at these verses. First Corinthians chapter one, verses one. I mean, First Corinthians. I'm sorry, I give the wrong chapter. First Corinthians chapter ten, excuse mm -hmm. me, verses one through eleven, and Hebrews chapter four and Hebrews chapter three. May God bless you. May God mercy and light shine upon you. These are precious gem and promises that he's extended to each and every one of us. I invite you to go back into the word and read it and join us next week. And next week I'll be joined by Sister Veronica Johnson who will co-teach the Sabbath School lesson with us next week. Amen. Amen. when you come in. We are writing your names down and we're having you gel in with our hand sanitizer. And if you don't have a mask, don't worry about it because we have you covered. So we hope to see you next Sabbath. Have a happy Sabbath. We miss you. We miss you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now.
of faith found in Exodus chapter 20 verses 8 through 11 and Matthew chapter 28 verses 19 and 20. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. 
Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Welcome to the South Park Seventh-day Adventist Church. And it's that time of our service where we bring our petitions before the Lord. Today is 9-11, September 11th, and it's interesting, I was just mentioning this in Sabbath school, that 20 years ago today, on that Tuesday, I remember like it was yesterday, 20 years ago, the world changed, and the fact that our privacy came at a price. The fact that you and I have an opportunity to worship the way we do, to celebrate God the way we do, all came into question. What would you do to secure your freedom? What would you do if someone were to say to you, I don't like the way you believe or what you believe? People who did not like this country or what we believe in our freedoms we had decided to take things in their own hands. They hijacked planes leaving out of Boston, came down a highway in New York that we call I-90, took a left where we lived in upstate New York and followed the Hudson River all the way down to the end. And if you're from the Northeast, you realize back in the day the Hudson River ended even if you were lost, it ended at the end. And on the left-hand side, you saw these towers. You couldn't help but see them. They stood tall like beacons of light. When the North Tower was smoldering, people thought, it's just a freak accident. What's going on? Friends were calling me, and I remember telling on the television, I was watching the Today Show, Brian Gumbel, I believe, was on at the time, or maybe Katie Kirk, I think it was Katie Kirk. And they said, there was an accident here at the, at the North Tower. The lights were on. It was a bright, crisp Tuesday morning. And all of a sudden, while you're watching the television, out of nowhere come this plane and ran right into the building. And instantaneously, you knew that things would never be the same. Psalms 91 says, verse 14 and 15, 15 says, You shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. Long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Judgment Day came for 2,997 people in New York at that moment. Instantaneously, life in this country changed, privacy changed, security matters changed. And I'm not a doomsayer, but I will tell you this. If we're not prepared every night when we lay our head on our pillow, the next face we see will be Jesus Christ. Either the first or the second resurrection. I pray we all prepare for what trump? That first trump. Amen? And I pray that you and I will be prepared to see him. On 9-11, when this took place, America went to war. We just ended the war in Afghanistan less than, I think it was August 31st. We are at war right now over your salvation and my soul's salvation. And Christ is pleading with you and I to take hold of that anchor, not to forsake the opportunity and the position that we have right now to secure our own faith. And 
we need to take advantage of the opportunity we have and the opportunity we have to come to Christ and to come into this house of worship. One day, we may, may not be able to walk into here. One day, we may not be able to broadcast live. We may not be able to tap in virtually. So I'm asking you to take advantage of the opportunity we have to call upon Jesus while he can't be called upon, while the doors of the probation are open. We have several people on our prayer list. We have a special prayer this week for Sister Lisa Green and family. Her daughter passed away this week. Please, let's remember them. Their funeral is going to be September 15th, which I believe is Wednesday. It will be from 3 to 5 p.m. at the Wesleyan Chapel. If I have this wrong, please forgive me. The W.E. Luzane Chapel. I apologize. Luzane Chapel. Apologize for that. Also on our, our, our sick and shut-in list, we have Brother Johnny Tate, Sister Annie Brown, Sister Vanessa Turner, Brother Willie Crum, Sister Carrie Given, Sister Alice Griffin, Sister Roberta Relliford, Sister Rosa McCall, Sister Angela Crum, S um, Sister Willie P. Hill, Brother Robert and Mildred Carey. I see them in the audience this morning. Welcome. Amen. I also like to add Sister Bell. Sister Bell came to the church this week. I need to get some food from the pantry. Let's give our, all these people in the city and center shut in list and people that you don't see, give them a call. We could be missionaries on our phone. Can, amen? For those who are able to kneel and pray, please do so. If you cannot, let's bow our heads for, for prayer. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, I thank you for your kindness and mercy. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for those things that you've done for us, even when we have not been worthy to receive them. But I ask you, dear God, just right now, to have mercy upon us as a nation, as a people, and as your children. As a nation, I'm asking you to have mercy upon us, even though we celebrate and commemorate 9-11, have mercy upon us with this virus that is raging through our community, especially here in Birmingham and in Alabama. Alabama has one of the highest infections rate here in this country. So many unbelievers of masks. I'm not here to promote any vaccination. I'm not a medical professional, but I am here to promote protection. We need to be protected. Help us to use common sense my wife tells me all the time that common sense is not common. But I pray, dear God, Jesus, that we would use good sense and that we will have common sense and understand that we need to be protected and use common sense to protect ourselves and our family. Help us to be wise. Help us to be diligent. Help us to be intelligent and not to be a transmitter of the virus or pick up the virus, but help us to realize that we need to be protected from this virus. It has no reference or preference of person. Whether you yellow, pink, green, black, or white, it doesn't matter. It's taking people out. One of my fraternity brothers died a week and a half ago. Strong black man, an attorney, found unresponsive in his house. Rushed him to the hospital, put him on a ventilator, he was gone. One of the lead deacons in our home church back home in New York passed away a week ago. They had his funeral a week ago Friday. Many people are being taken out. So I'm asking you, dear God, Jesus, to help us to be smart, help us to be intelligent, and help us to be protected. I pray, dear God, also that we will not walk around here mindful, thinking that time will go on and things will go on as usual. You are coming back and time is getting short. So I pray that we take advantage of the opportunities that we have before us to call upon your name, to make you our soul um, savior and make you our redeemer. And I pray, dear God, Jesus, that you will forgive us for all of our sins. Help us to be your witnesses. Please remember all those on the sick and shut-in list. Please remember our speaker of the hour. I pray that you please bless him, strengthen him, bind him, allow his words be your words.
and I pray that we'll be uplifted, not just entertained, but inspired to be better, inspired to be more than you would have us to be. And I pray in the end that we will be reflective of you in words, deeds, and in our actions. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Happy Sabbath, church family. Those of you that are present and those of you that are streaming virtually, it is indeed a blessing to be alive today. If you agree with that, say amen. amen. It's a blessing to be in the land. Good news travels so quickly, especially when you're streaming on this service on Sabbath morning and on Wednesdays. And so on last week, um, I was home and I got the good news about the August financial report as it relates to the church building fund. Now, I remember when I came to you before that it was going to be done in chunks or parts. And so during the month of August, how much money were we to raise? $6,000. And we were to do that by making a sacrifice. I told you I was doing a lot of recycling. Well, guess what, people? I have not been to the mall yet. I'm still, what, recycling. I'm re-wearing. I'm doing whatever I need to do so I can just put a little bit more to the side for the cause of God. But this morning, as I was studying for the Sabbath school lesson today, God gave me, God woke me up early. I wanted to lay, lay in the bed a little bit longer, but God got me out of the bed. He said, Sister, Sister Bernita, I need you to give them this text. And so if you don't mind, if you'll just open your digital device or your Bibles and turn to Isaiah 32, 20. That's the text for today. So as you walk forward, as you talk to people, Isaiah 32, 20 and it says because I'm looking for a blessing every day every way I can find it I need the blessings of the Lord in my life in such a land as we that we're living in it says you, you're gonna need to be blessed it says in Isaiah 32 20 I'm just gonna take the first part of it it says blessed are ye that sow beside all waters now your version may be different from mine but I just needed to get an understanding what does it mean when it says you are blessed when you sow beside all waters? It means to sow beside all waters means to give wherever your help is needed. So you, if it's at South Park in the, with the finances, if it's in your neighborhood, if it's with your family, to sow beside all waters means to help where you can. Now, you may not ever be publicly recognized for it. It might be something you and God only know about. But I want to admonish the children of God in these last days. Sow beside all waters. That means if something comes to your attention, and it's within your power to do. And I'm talking to myself right now because I had a conversation about teaching so many Sabbath school lessons. But God says, you do what you got to do while the time you are able to do it. As I look back over these last year or so, so many were in our midst, not in our midst. Some people are gone. So you don't have forever to do what you need to do. So when God tells you to sow beside all waters, you're going to run up against something this day, maybe this week, within the month or so. And I want you to remember Isaiah 32, 20. To sow beside all waters means to help where you can. So I want to thank you. I want to thank you for allowing the Lord to use you for the month of August of raising the $6,000. What month is this? September. How much money do we need for the month of September? For the... $6,000. We are slowly moving toward that, that, that point. And so if you have friends, if you're making a sacrifice, I'm literally making a sacrifice for the cause of God, please remember to give to Adventist Giving, and that is www.adventistgiving.org. Or better yet, if you have continued to mail your uh, funds in, please do so to South Park SDA Church, P.O. Box 110475. Birmingham, Alabama, and the South Park, S-D-A-A-L, church, AdventistChurch.org. Any way possible, let's continue. Now, Elder McKnight and is continuing to work, all of those working with him. After the month of September, because I like for you to know things and I like to be, provide clarity. So August was $6,000, that's done, we're moving on. We're in the month of September, we still need $6,000. If, if the Lord should delay his coming and we're still here, we see it through September, 
once we raise that, and by faith, I do believe we're going to raise that. Will somebody please join me and say amen? amen. Now, if somebody just wants to give $6,000 today, please know we'll be blessed to receive it. Oh, yeah, mm -mm. Let, yeah, just bring it on. Thank you. But needless to say, if we all collectively work together for this purpose, we will be blessed. Now, after the month of September, then um, I understand there is a strategic plan. There is a building permit that needs to come forth so that they can continue to do the work. And we'll talk to you about that later. But how much do we need? One more time. Amen. And may God help us all. And let us, let us just bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we're understanding, I'm understanding more and more that it's not about what I say. It's about the Holy Spirit moving upon the hearts of your people. We all have something that we have to do. And right now there is a project before us. Lord, bless like no one else can bless. And all that we can say is God did it. Amen. Let God's people say amen. Amen. Thank you. Have a blessed day. Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 1 through 8. We're looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 1 through 8. My version may be a little bit different than yours. I'm reading out the New King James Version. So uh, just, just bear with me here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 1 through 8. And it says, Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more 
just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter. Because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. Verse 7, for God did not call us to uncleanliness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. Look at your neighbor and say, Brother Baker finna talk about sex today. I want to speak from the subject, sex in the city. Sex in the city. Let us pray. Dear Lord, these are not my words. These are your words. Please use me as I prepare to speak to your people. In Jesus' name, I thank you and I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Sex in the city. Look at your neighbor and say, he about to talk about you this morning. He about to talk about you. Some years ago, between 1998 and 2004, there was an HBO series called Sex in the City. How many of y'all saw it? Just raise your hands up high. How many of y'all saw it? So I can see who all the heathens in here today. Okay. I've never watched the program personally, but I've heard about it. As a matter of fact, I thought it was called Sex in the City until I was researching this sermon, I went to the website and saw it was called Sex and the City. But I thought I would talk about it this morning because the reality of the fact is, sex is an issue in our society. Let me just say this before I get started. If all y'all say amen through the course of this whole sermon, nobody know I'm talking about you this morning, okay? Say amen through the whole sermon, nobody know I'm talking about you, all right? All right, let's dive in, amen? Oh, y'all on it. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. We need to talk about sex because it's the one thing tearing Christians apart. It's pulling us down. It's defeating us. It's frustrating us, causing us not to be what God desires us to be. And I thought I would spend some time talking about it because I realized how big of a problem and struggle it is. From high school to college to doing Bible work to working regular jobs, I meet more and more people who deal with this issue, sex. So let me just go ahead and tell you, sex among singles is alive and well. It's thriving. It's flaming. If y'all all just say amen together, nobody will know. I'm telling you. It's alive. And sex is alive and well in the married community as well. Just not with the spouse that they married to. Paul the Apostle writes to the church in Thessalonica. It's a church he founded. He started the church. And he is writing them after he has departed. It's a young church. And he recognizes the need to talk to them about sexual purity. And so he is writing this letter in his first epistle to them. He needs to talk about sex. I want to press this issue and talk to us about it. I know it's challenging. I know the hormones are raging. I know that the passions are alive and well. But here's the thing that all of us have to be clear about. God has something to say about sex. As a matter of fact, he gives very clear instructions about it. Now, before I apply this pressure, because it's going to get tense in here this morning, I already feel it. Let me read verse 8 one more time. It says, therefore, he who rejects this does not reject Brother Baker, but God. I'm just going to throw that out there because some of y'all don't like to talk about sex. It seems to be a taboo subject in the church. People like to pretend like they ain't never done it. They had it together their whole life. They've been saved since they came out the womb. But that's why I wanted to read verse 8 again. So that you will recognize that this is not my message, my instruction. This is instruction from God. 
So let's do a little bit of Bible study this morning. Uh, Y'all behind ain't studying at home, but we're going to get it in today. Let's look at a few verses real quick. If you got your Bible, say amen. Amen. If I'm moving a little too fast, y'all just going to have to keep up with me because I'm going to go through these texts. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3, and we're going to listen to what it says. And this is just a prerequisite. I want to look at a couple of verses so we can get clarity about what God says about sex. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3, and it says, But fornication and all uncleanliness or covetousness, let it not be named among you as is fitting for saints. The King James Version says, let it not be named once among you. Don't let it be mentioned one time that this has been your behavior. The Bible's crystal clear about this. I'm moving on to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11. Listen to what it says. Verse 11, but now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an adulterer or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner not even to eat with such a person here's what the scripture is saying if you know somebody who is participating in sexual immorality don't even eat a meal with them some of y'all in here gonna lose y'all's friends today don't associate, don't hang out, don't keep company. I didn't write this. This was already here when I got here. We're going to look at the very next chapter in Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm going to read verses 13 through 20. We're going to get some good clarity about this thing this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 13 to 20. It says, foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods. But God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. Verse 17. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God, and you are not your own. For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Tell your neighbor, your body don't belong to you, it belongs to God. Now tell your other neighbor, your body ain't yours, it's the Lord's. While we're here, we're going to go on to the next chapter. Look at it, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 to 2. And it says, Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Listen, if you can't keep yourself under control, get married. If y'all all just say amen together, nobody will know I'm talking about you. Find you a wife, find you a husband, get connected with somebody. That's an acceptable reason to get married. You know, it's amazing to me how you can sleep with someone today and it can cost you your life. I know that the fear of sexually transmitted diseases has never stopped a person in the heat of passion. That's why disease is still being spread. People still popping up pregnant. We got whole TV shows built on 
and you are the father. There's a blatant disregard for scripture among people who attend church. People who say they believe in God, they say they believe in Jesus, they say they believe in the Bible, but we are disregarding because I found and still finding that the pandemic of sexual immorality, both fornication and adultery, is all over the place. It's everywhere. It's thriving. I wish it wasn't true, but it is. Somebody on your role is guilty of one of those things. That's right, just look straight ahead. Don't look to the left or the right, just, just look straight ahead. Keep looking at me. It's a lifestyle. It has become a lifestyle. I think it's one thing for a person to trip up and fall and make a mistake. But it's another thing to make your bed in it, put a couch there, have an address with mail delivered to it, live in it like it's okay. We have accepted it because society pushes this sex thing down our throats. They make it feel like just because the movie stars are doing it, the athletes are doing it, and everybody else, they have set and established a culture where it has become acceptable in society. Now people are bold. They proud. They bragging. From talking to older folks, I understand there used to be a time if you were participating in fornication, they would hide it. Some of the older folks might, might, might be able to help me testify. But now people are bold. They're open about it. I understand there used to be a time where if you were shacking with somebody, you didn't leave the house at the same time. You will walk out first and the other person will walk out 10 minutes later. But now, it's known. They vacation together. They travel together. They sleeping together. Both their names on the house in the apartment. And there's a level of arrogance and sin that I'm trying to call out today. I'm calling it out today. So you won't be able to stand before God and say, Brother Baker didn't tell you. You won't be able to say, I didn't learn it at South Park Church at the 11 a.m. Divine Worship Service. That is wrong. That's the reality. The scripture is very clear. I went through those verses just a few moments ago so that you could clearly see that the scripture speaks to this issue. And one day, everybody is going to have to stand before a holy God and give an answer to the behavior they have done in regards to controlling their flesh. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul talks to them, and let me lay out to you what he talks about. He gives us a lot of clarity about this thing. Verse 1, finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Paul says we giving you specific instructions, Paul says to the church in Thessalonica. For this is the will of God, verse 3, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. Now somebody holler at me and say sanctification. That's the word nobody wants to talk about today. But sanctification means purity. That you set yourself aside to live pure before God. That you are dedicating yourself, not that you're perfect, because ain't nobody in here perfect. Everybody in here has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But sanctification means I'm making an effort to give myself to God so he can use me for his glory. I'm trying to do right. There's a level of purity. Verse 3 says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. Then here's what's going to mess everybody up in their sanctification. That you should abstain from sexual immorality. That you should abstain from loose living. Feeding your selfish, fleshly, sexual drives and desires. Because the reality is, 99% of the people in this room, 99% of the people watching on the internet, 99 on the internet, 99% of you got sexual drives. And if you don't have sexual drives, well, you probably just an old fart or something. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Lord, forgive me. The question is, how are 
are you managing your drives? <laughs> what are you doing about those passions? Are you letting them run rampant? Or are they brought under control of the Holy Spirit? Paul says, I want you to learn how to do this. Then he says in verse 4, and here's my first point. I got three simple points I want to cover this morning. The first point is, know how to control your stuff. You got to know how to control your stuff. Be aware of how you handle your equipment. And that's what it says in verse 4, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessels in sanctification and honor. That each of you should know how to control your own bodies. That word honor means value. Put some value on yourself. Sister girl, put some value on yourself. You're not a whore. You're not a tramp. You're not a prostitute. Take the sign down. Carry yourself like the respectable, beautiful woman that God created you to be. Know how to possess and control your stuff. Some people being quiet today, but that's okay. I know it's a little tension in here for somebody. But the Lord is using me today to help free you up. You won't have to tighten up no more when the pastor get up here and talk about something. I'm talking to you. I'm preaching to you. I'm declaring to you that God sees you. He is not happy about what you're doing. He's trying to string you up. He's trying to strain you out. He's trying to get you out of fornication, get you out of adultery, get you out of pornography, get you out of whatever it is you're doing that's not pleasing him. Get you out of masturbate. Leave yourself alone. Leave yourself alone. <laughs> Here's point number two. I got to roll on. I got to roll on. Point number one was control your stuff. Point number one was control your stuff. Handle your equipment. Point number two, we're looking at verse five. It says, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Don't allow your flesh to control your decisions. That's point number two. Don't allow your flesh to control your decisions. See, some of us are driven by our flesh. We are letting our flesh call the shots. It says, don't live your life in the passion of lust. The King James Version uses the word concupiscence. But the New King James Version translates it passion of lust. And here's what that means. It means your longing for sexual desire is stronger than your spiritual desire. Your excitement for sexual activity is stronger and more powerful than your desire for the things of God. And he says, don't allow your flesh to control. Listen, everybody in here has some level of passion. The thing is, don't let your sexual passion overtake your spiritual passions. Everybody in here got some dog in you. You got some dog in you. Some of us got a German Shepherd. Some of us got a Poodle. But the point is, you got some dog in you. And everybody in here got to learn how to get your dog in check, get it on the leash, and in the doghouse. I know some of y'all might not be enjoying the message today, but that's okay. That's all right. I don't speak for people to like or approve of me. But I'm trying to drive something home to you all, that this sex thing is out of control. And God is calling us to say, to, to reel it back in. Say, reel it back in. So don't allow your flesh to control your decisions. I'm almost finished. Here's the third and final point. Point one was control your equipment. Point two is don't let your flesh call the shots. And point three is, don't cross the line. We're looking at verses six and seven now. And it says that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter. Because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanliness, but in holiness. 
I want to stop and deal with that for just a second in, in verse 6. That word defraud means to arouse sexual desires in a person that cannot be righteously satisfied. You're arousing the desires in another person and that desire cannot be satisfied righteously. That's what the word defraud means. And God is saying to you, you better be careful of how you may be arousing the desires in somebody. Well, now you're saying, Brother Baker, how can you arouse the desires in somebody? Well, I'm here today to tell you, you can do that in a lot of ways. You can do it by the words, the conversations. Let's be honest for a second. Some of y'all's telephone conversations, text messages, Snapchats, DMs, and emails for those who still doing that leave a lot to be desired. Your words, your pictures, the way you dress, your attire. Be careful what kind of music you listen to. Music will arouse your sexual passions. And the scripture is clear right here in verse 6 that God is the avenger of those who do these things. That word avenge means God will punish you. Now, I do believe God is a God of mercy. He gives us another chance. He gives us a chance to repent, turn it around, change. But some of what people are going through in life is God punishing you for the choices and the behavior that you made. God will punish you. He will discipline you. Yes, he loves you. He cares about you. He wants you to make the right choices, but make no mistake, he will punish you. And some of y'all today should have been punished a long time ago by God. I know it's going to get quiet on that one. But you ought to thank God he didn't give you what you deserve. He gave you another chance. Ain't nobody in here perfect. I already said that. Ain't nobody in here perfect. 99% of y'all got sexual passions, sexual drives, emails, pornography, relationships that are outside the boundaries of what God's will is. And some of you have overcome those things, gotten the victory over it, and straightened out your life. But I'm here to declare and preach to everybody in this room, I don't care where you are, I don't care how deep you are, I don't care how frequently, you, how frequently you've been involved in it, I don't care who it's been with, I don't care how much money you spent, I'm here to give you the great news, there is power in the blood of Jesus to deliver you and free you from the stronghold of sexual immorality. Free you from wrong relationships, free you from pornography, free you from masturbation. Whatever it is, there is power in the name and the blood of Jesus to free you from your bondage and help you walk and live a pure life. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But I thank God that he spared our lives long enough to bring us to a place that our slate can be wiped clean and we can be free by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm here today to tell you that that's good news. Look at your neighbor and tell him that's good news. So I want to pray today before it's too late that you will come to realize you need forgiveness from God. And know that he is sitting there waiting for you with open arms. Ready to forgive you for whatever you have done in your past. I'm done today. Everybody please stand to your feet. We're about to get ready to pray. Dear Lord, thank you for the word you have given today, Lord. Lord, some of us are struggling with this thing called sex. Some of us may not be struggling in the sexual arena, but maybe some other arena. Lord, we want to ask for your power to help deliver us from the stronghold that sin has in our life. Only you can do it, Lord. Some of us have been struggling for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, Lord. Lord, please draw that person back to you today. 
Please continue to allow them to come to this church where they can hear the unfiltered, unadulterated content that you would have people to speak. Please free people from that bondage so they won't tighten up and get nervous and have to hide what they're going through, Lord. This is a place of love where we can share our problems and help each other, Lord. Please equip everybody in here to be able to help another person so we all may be able to enjoy the riches you have in glory for us. In Jesus' name, I thank you and I pray. Amen. Something, decisions, the vision, provision Better than what I envision So when I look back on tough times Imprisoned once by my own mind Take what I remember, wrap it up, make it better And use all I had gone through and use it like a lever I have come to know a deeper truth that only took forever Blessings on blessings, endeavor, work Knowing I could take, break, shake, elevate And use my blessings for you in the midst of my heartache And now that I'm grateful for don't always look so nice At first maybe you had it, but late to be the prize that's why I'm grateful and I lift my hands today Knowing I have made it through with no guarantee this way Call me crazy foolish, go ahead, say what you like But to know my greatest praises, you would need to know my life Blessings I am filled with blessings Don't need a good mood to appreciate all the good Blessings I am filled with blessings Don't need a good mood to appreciate all the good blessings, 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 from heaven. to a 